I'm Jean-Claude. I'm here on my old farm in Western Massachusetts, now Shantigar Foundation for Creativity, Meditation, and Engaging with Nature. I'm so pleased that we can mark the date that was yesterday, May 10th, 1940 was 80 years ago. Yesterday was May 10th, 2020. I'm here with my dear friend, Didi Goldenhaar. She was born of a Belgian family, as I was. Her mother had to hide out during the war. My mother drove us through the bombs in France, eventually to safety to meet my father. It's a terribly emotional time. It's more emotional because there are many people knocking on America's door. There are children imprisoned on our southern borders. The extremity of feeling of being refugees Didi's wonderful short documentary, Return to Calais, which we'll watch in a moment, so expresses my feelings and her feelings about it. Didi? Hi, Jean-Claude. Hey, Didi. May 10th, 1940. May 10th, 2020. Yesterday was Mother's Day. We both had powerful influences through our mothers. We've often talked about our mothers. Our mothers were beautiful, both of them. Beautiful. Your mother was beautiful. I met her. I had that privilege. My mother was beautiful. We got to say that. Got to. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Jean-Claude. We have been together in many different kinds of ways since we met 40 years ago when I stage managed his production, his translation of Chekhov's Three Sisters in a faintly crumbling mansion in the Hudson River Valley. And since that time, we've been roommates, colleagues, dear, dear friends, and I'm so proud to be a member of the board of the Shantigar Foundation. I'm so glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing in a time that lacks laughter. But we're trying to keep our spirits afloat. And part of the way we do that is to raise up the people who saved us. We were both fortunate in our family histories that despite the danger and perilous journeys that our families were compelled to take as a result of war, there were those who stepped up, in Jean-Claude's case, a person in public authority, and in my mother's case, a private citizen, each of whom displayed the empathy and courage to care for others and in these times, in these times of COVID-19 and in the desperate conditions for refugees on our own southern borders and in Europe, we wanted very much to commemorate May 10th, 1940 and to bring forth the saviors of yesterday and today. Yes, thank you, Didi, for saying it so beautifully. This film resulted from a pilgrimage I took to Calais in 2018, following my mother's vivid wartime diary when she was a refugee age 12, joining thousands of refugees on the roads from Brussels into Northern France. Which was about the time when I was four years old, my mother drove us along those very roads. 
when my grandmother said everything with wheels was on the roads of France and the bombs were falling. Yes, and my mother wrote, the wheel, a magical invention. Mm. Before we show the film, I would just like to thank Jane Stewart and Jonathan Cole, the directors of the Black Mariah Film Festival, who've joined our virtual family here at Shantigar by co-sponsoring this film today. I'm very honored that they selected the film for their 2020 roster of short films. And now without further ado, we'll see the film and then Jean-Claude will share his vivid recollections of May 1940. J'ai oublié 30 ans de vie, des choses qui sont passées. Ça, c'est dans ma mémoire, oui. comme si oui. ça s'était passé hier. Et alors, il dit, mais ça fait rien. Il dit, moi, je vais tuer le cochon, je tuerai le mien, je vous le donnerai. Parce que mon père, quand même. Pourquoi les années de la guerre vivent dans ma mémoire Chaque jour presque, chaque moment, je revois le matin du 10 mai 1940. J'avais 12 ans et demi. Je me suis réveillée plus tôt que d'habitude. J'entendais des sons brusques mais étouffés. Comme des éclatements de pneus. Je me suis réveillée complètement et j'ai demandé à mon père « Pourquoi ne m'as-tu pas réveillée pour aller à l'école ?» Il n'y a plus d'école. C'est la guerre. My mother told her stories all the time. She told them to anyone who would listen. And why wouldn't she? They were the, they were the times that formed her. Um, after my mother died in 2016, I found journals that she wrote about the war years 10 years later. The stories began always on May 10th, 1940. That was a date as embedded in our family lore as anyone's birth date or death date or wedding anniversary. War. La guerre. Ce mot n'évoquait rien sauf qu'une image projetée sur un écran. Une bombe éclatant dans un champ, la poussière s'envolant. Les gens sont tendus à l'extrême. Il faut fuir. Fuir où La famille, peu à peu, a commencé à agir. Chacun s'en va vers l'incertain. Une seule pensée. Il faut partir. Au revoir. She says at one point, my parents had told me about the first world war. The soldiers waiting on food lines, the devastation. That war had lasted four years. Would this war also last four years? But why think about the future? This was a chance to escape a habit. It was an adventure, and it was the most beautiful spring ever with the most glorious flowers. That's the thing is my mother told her stories of the war with a lot of verve, with a lot of humor even and spirit because she said when you're a kid, You don't imagine the worst. Well, she was also very fortunate, so she told her stories with the understanding that her life had been saved twice. Je revois la gare du Midi. J'imagine d'en haut, elle doit faire l'effet d'une fourmilière ou ressembler à des grappes de raisin. Gens jeunes, vieux, devant des caisses de bois, des paniers de paille, des valises luxueuses, tout le monde se pousse, pas de regard. L'air absolument irrespirable. 
Nous avons embarqué le train à 11h du matin. À 6h du soir, nous avons enfin quitté la gare du midi. They were a family of seven. My mother, her parents, her uncle Morris and Rose, their three-month-old baby Yvette and grandmother Shafrin. Destination France, north of France, because France was still free. Quelle joie! Aucun contrôle. Nous passons librement. Nous sommes sauvés. Le passage de cette ligne imaginaire a suffi pour remplir nos cœurs de joie et d'espérance. La marche a commencé. La marche des fuyards. Tous ceux qui avaient mis la clé sous la porte et avaient fui. And they walk. For a few days, walking, a British military truck picked them up in Dunkirk during the Battle of Dunkirk and takes them to Calais. There they are, the family of seven in the old city, standing on those cobblestone streets, not knowing anyone, not knowing where to go. My mother spoke of this moment, often, how an old lady approached them. Venez avec moi, come with me, and took them into her house, warmed milk for the baby, made a cradle by lining a dresser drawer with a blanket, and sheltered them, harbored them throughout the bombing during the siege of Calais. But who was the old lady? My mother always called her that, la vieille dame. Then in the journal, I find her. Dear Madame Ducatel, Marie Louise Ducatel. Il me reste le goût acidulé du cidre aux pommes qu'elle préparait. They stay with Madame Ducatel throughout the days of bombing. During those times, she and the family and everyone in the street and their animals went down into the neighbor's basement. The warning noises Les alertes se répètent, sont tristes, ponctuées de sirènes comme le cri d'un hibou. Les hommes se tenaient à la porte, regardant les fusées éclairantes qui balayaient le ciel de Calais. Les murmures incessants des prières et invocations. And then the morning when everything was silent. It's dawn. Dawn tinted with death. The sounds of shooting. The rumbling of trucks. The brief orders. The Germans are in the city. The date, 27th of May, 1940. The Germans take the city and they send the Belgians home. They repatriate them back to Belgium. But within several months, the Nazi restrictions began to fall on the Jews, starting with the Yellow Star. Then no more cinema or going to cafes. Then my mother could no longer go to school. 
and my grandfather lost his business. Uh, in August of 1942, they received the order to present themselves at the train station with a rucksack for each of them containing two days of food. And that was the signal to disappear immediately. They were taken in by Fernand Esnault and his family in a small village called Le Chenois near Waterloo. And there they remained as part of the family hidden until the liberation of Belgium in 1944. That's a very long story for another time. Here is my mother immediately after liberation. Look at this face. She's 17. Wow. She's free. remember my mother saying, why do the years of the war live on in my memory? Why do the years of my mother's war live on in my memory? Uh, because they were so much a part of my childhood and growing up, they're so much a part of my interior life. She was all for living in the now. favorite saying, her creed, came from the Latin poet Horace, life is short and one must hasten to enjoy it. And yet, throughout my childhood and decades after, she would point out newspaper photos and television footage of refugees beyond World War II, from the 1960s in Vietnam, through to the 1990s in the Balkans, and into the last few years of her life as refugees were fleeing Syria and crossing to Libya and crossing the Mediterranean to the Greek islands. So I have been consuming and consumed by news of refugees over these past years, knowing that every two seconds someone is compelled to leave home. And that Calais is again a destination for refugees. Refugees come hundreds daily, hoping to make it to England, just 18 nautical miles away. I wanted to learn more, so I wrote to Care for Calais, a British humanitarian group that brings food, tea, clothing, sleeping bags, medical help to refugees in the city, along with other international and French groups. And they invited us to spend the day. We visited with the volunteers, people who come for a weekend, a week, perhaps several months, and they were curious, what are you doing here? And I tell them the story of visiting Madame Ducatel's house. And I say she was a single lady living alone in a small house. She was not a mother, but she mothered. These small, unforgettable gestures. And I say, yes, it's important. Feels good to come here and to say her name, Marie-Louise Ducatel. But it's even more important to say Jess 
Leo, Emily, Leona. You are the Madame Ducatels today. Some of these refugees, we hope, will rebuild their lives and they'll tell their children about you, your gestures, and they will say your name. What a beautiful, beautiful film, Dee. When I hear French spoken, I feel at home with family. I am with family when I'm with you. So much was not said when I was growing up. 80 years ago, May 10th, 1940, at about four in the morning, I woke up to loud sounds outside the window. I was scared. I lowered the sides of my bed, little slatted child's bed. I was all of three. I went into the living room. My mother, my very beautiful mother, who looked a lot like Ingrid Bergman. My mother was, I guess she was 27 at that point. She was quickly putting things into a suitcase in the living room. What is all that noise, I asked her. She improvised. It's the noise from the trucks being repaired next door from the cars, you know, there's a garage next door. I knew she was lying. I always could tell when my mother was lying. She yelled to the maid, a young woman. She said, put on his rust colored coat, put on his matching rust colored cap, don't bother taking off his pajamas. She said to me, we're going for a ride with your grandparents. We're going for a ride with my grandparents. I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. We went to Avenue Montjoie, 212 Avenue Montjoie in Euclid, to pick up my paternal grandparents. My father was extremely provident and he had seen what was coming. My father was in the Belgian army. He was stationed in a small town. He'd seen that the soldiers were being given leave for five days. So he assumed that meant that the invasion was coming. Very smart, my father. He had prepared my mother for this occasion. She had not driven very often. She'd driven once to go see him when he was doing an apprenticeship in Germany. So she drove to my grandparents' house, my paternal grandparents, they got in. We went to a restaurant outside of Brussels. There my coat was taken off, my pajamas, I was changed into clothes. I knew something was terribly wrong. I screamed and screamed. My father was in the Belgian army. He went through Brussels with his men, went to the apartment, Avenue Jeanne, where we were, picked up my mother's pearl necklace, and a lot of papers, got back in the car with the men, 
he says that as the Belgian army was being pushed toward the sea, he passed the king of Belgium, Leopold, with his generals. He could tell that because of the slope of the general's shoulders, that Belgium was about to surrender. My uncle Jacques kept a journal. He was in the Belgian army too, my mother's brother, Jacques Levy. He talks also about waking up at that four o'clock in the morning and the soldiers rallying. We got to the seashore. My maternal grandparents, Grandpapa and Grandmama, my mother's parents, were at home. They had gone with my Aunt Nellie. My grandmother had gone with my Aunt Nellie to buy brown paper to put over the windows. They'd set up a kind of shelter downstairs. They still had their gas masks from World War II. World War I, excuse me. Eventually, my, my mother called my grandmother. She said, you really have to come, get out of there. In the night, my grandmother describes going to the window of her house, seeing the bombs falling, not yet knowing that she wasn't supposed to be at the window. And in the middle of the night, they did decide to leave. My uncle Jacques had a furlough with some army friends of his. They came to the house, they had a ham omelet, and they left and closed the door for my grandmother and grandfather, who drove to the seashore to join my mother and me, and my Aunt Nellie came with them. We also had the, the Jeanne, who was the young maid I mentioned, was with us. The next day, my mother drove across the border into France. Everybody in my family seemed to be writing things. My grandmother wrote a journal. She was born French. She said how welcoming the French were. She was very proud of them. At one point, the little cart overturned. We were driving through a crowded France my grandmother mentions in her journal, my grandmother, Germaine Lévy, that everything with wheels was on the roads of France. At one point, the cart overturned. At that, at that moment, actually, Jeanne wasn't there. She kept flirting with soldiers, apparently. And a, a farmer named Jean Paris came, helped us. We slept that night in a barn. I remember my grandmother, my, my, my paternal grandmother, was ill, so she got in, she had a big bed, I had a little bed, everybody else slept on the floor. I remember waving to her, thinking this was pretty exciting. We continued on eventually to Bordeaux. My father joined us. He was at Dunkirk. He had actually, he actually put on a British helmet, he and a friend of his. They were then pulled onto a ship by British soldiers. They went to England, and then with these only Belgian platoon came back to France. In Bordeaux, my father managed through meeting a friend of his to rent a room or an apartment that was above the wonderful Portuguese consul Aristide de Sousa Mendes, who, speaking of heroes, he gave visas despite being told not to by his boss, Pedro Salazar, to about 30,000 fleeing Jews. We would be dead if it weren't for him. My paternal grandparents took a boat to England from Bordeaux, which was reserved for Dutch nationals, or we might have been on it too. My grandparents had dual nationality. They'd been born in Holland. I remember standing on the deck, on the dock, waving at my grandparents, holding my parents hands, thinking a ship like that is certainly going to sink. I've never, I'd never seen a big metal ship like that. Anyway, my grandparents were killed when the next day a U-boat shot torpedoes at them. The extraordinary thing is that they were rarely mentioned in the house as I was growing up in Great Neck. There was something we all knew that we'd gone through this, but the experiences of the Holocaust weren't mentioned very much. We did get through. 
thanks to Sousa Mendes, thanks to, thanks to a friend of my maternal grandfather who was a glove manufacturer who knew the Secretary of State, who sent visas to Portugal where we were able to get on, of all things, a Japanese ship. We were saved. We were extraordinarily fortunate. I, I, I'm glad to be able to talk about these things. It was a moment of terrible fear, which I think has lived in me since then. It's, I think, something that we can all feel now in this moment of plague. We're back in a situation of extreme tension and danger. It's odd to me that my life is bookended by these two major, major events. In my life, I think it's given me some perspective. I think it's why I came as a kind of messenger. I grew up in Great Neck, a place with no sense of death at all. And it seemed to me in some sense a facade. So I wrote plays about tearing down facades, feeling that somewhere something wasn't being said, some fear was not being expressed. But I'm also so grateful to my mother who drove us through the bombs, who, and my father who figured it all out and I'm here today to tell the story. Um, Dee Dee, you want to say something? Dee Dee, you there? Yes. <laughs> Good. Jean-Claude and I had spoken about doing some kind of public event in Manhattan on this yeah. day months ago, who before, any of us imagined this period that we're in. When I looked at the film today and I say in the film about my mother's hiding, that's a very long story for another time. I had no idea that time would be so relevant exactly now. We're living in a time now where we're told to shelter in place, stay at home, but the situation of refugees and asylum seekers and the homeless is one in which they have no shelter or place to call home. We're all very struck by that, I'm sure. A few months after I returned from Calais, I received an email out of the blue from a British playwright Matilda Velovich, who is also a Care for Calais volunteer. She wrote me, she said, I, I've heard about your visit to Calais and to Care for Calais. I've written a play called Three Mothers about mothers and how they forge on in the midst of conflict like this. And I'm preparing to put it on tour in the United Kingdom for the annual Refugee Week. Would you like to contribute a three minute video that will accompany my publicity for this play? I said, well, okay. And out of that came this film with the help of a wonderful team of people at Rock, Paper, Scissors and people who helped me make this film. But what's really exciting today, having gone to England with the film and toured it with Matilda Velovich and her play is that Matilda is here today visiting from London, 11.30 p.m. And so Matilda, I was hoping you could talk to us about the situation in Calais now and about your experience as a volunteer for Care for Calais, my dear friend. <laughs> and she it's... also comes from Belgium. She I'm Belgian. It just goes to yeah. say we are all connected. Thank you. First, I just have to say that that the film every time gets me. Um, Paulette gave you a gift and you've spread the gift. And Jean-Claude, I think you, just listening to your story, you know, a lot of people don't tell their story. I think it's almost sometimes takes someone else to tell somebody's story. Mm. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I am Belgian. 
I was born in Ookla. My family by 1942 had arrived in England, but by sheer irony, I was born in Brussels in, um, this is real irony, Avenue Winston Churchill uh, in Ookla. But that's not what we're talking about today. Um, but it never fails to strike me when I'm in Calais that I am stepping on the same land that many of our families were in 80 years ago. It's mud and it's awful and it's difficult and we're there all over again. Um, and the reason I found out about Edith was simply because I had a huge uh, standoff with the policeman who said, I think you should go home to where you came from is what he said. And I, I suddenly crossed my mind. I said, but I'm, I am from here. This is where I'm from. Um, which is when someone introduced me to Edith's visit. She'd been there several months before. Um, the situation in Calais is terrible. I walk past Madame Ducatel's house quite often uh, because I now volunteer in a women's refuge house that looks very much like Madame Ducatel's house, which is only 300 meters from that very place where Paulette was taken in all those years ago. And I never fail to think of her as I walk past. Um, but there are a lot of good things that come out of Calais and that's actually what I'd like to spread with you all. I never, when I get back on that ferry or that train after a week or two weeks of freezing cold and mud and just uh, tear gas and just unrelenting you know, situations that take place, children, a lot of children and a lot of mothers, mm. Um, and various other things. I um, am always carrying several people's stories which are enlightening. Uh, I am always humbled by the fact that these people, like many people, only survive because they have such humanity and such, dig such dignity and everything is shared. And I actually don't think they could survive unless they operated like that. Um, a good lesson to us in the situation we're in now. Um, Edith was lucky enough, it was fantastic when she came to the UK and toured with me to meet a young man called Adam, who I first met sleeping outside in Calais at the age of 23, he'd fled Sudan. And the night I met him, the weather had turned cold and the police had slashed his tent and taken his sleeping bag the night before. And somehow he was telling it to me in a kind of humorous way. Um, so the last I thought I'd ever see of him was when I managed to get a tent and a sleeping bag to him before I returned to the UK. But it was not to be. Uh, four months later, he arrived in the UK. And when Edith came uh, and joined me in Sheffield, that is where he'd been placed. And we went out for pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and he very much felt like he was with his two mothers. And he is, if I was ever to use an example of a good reason why people should be given this chance, then Adam is my current one. Uh, he volunteers in local sporting clubs. He works by night. He learns English wherever he can, including visiting the local Pakistani center where lots of old ladies give him tea and his English is better than theirs, even though they've been in the country for a long time. <laughs> um, he is a marvelous person. He's 25 and he has everything ahead of him despite every delay. Um, I'm glad you met him, Edith. And um, I think that's all I need to say really, but I think your film has legs forever. You just keep sharing it, please. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing you've done. Thank you, Matilda. It's so good to see you. Really good. Um, <laughs> We have time for a few brief questions or thoughts you may have about refugees and, and saviors. I'm, I'm struck when I think of Paulette's story and Jean-Claude's, who our saviors were. Jean-Claude's Aristide de Souza Mendes was also a, a person in authority. And it was because of him that my father's family was saved. Maurice Goldenhar and his family also received visas. And, and Susan Mendez suffered greatly by defying his authorities. 
And in Paulette's case, it was an ordinary citizen, which just goes to show everyone has the opportunity to reach out and do something no matter where you are. Um, I know that Jane Stewart wanted to say something and she has been such a champion of this film, Jane. You know, I've, I've looked at Dee Dee's film, I have that privilege of viewing films that come to the Black Mariah Film Festival over and over and over. Um, but to, today when I was watching it, Dee Dee, you know what just really struck me was um, in your mother's, you know, discussion of what happened um, first, the sequence of shutting down the society. She said the cinemas closed, right? The cafes closed, the schools closed, and, 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 and. And isn't that where we are right now? Absolutely. So, I mean, of course, because I'm a filmmaker and, you know, I'm, I have the great privilege to, to see films and, and, and share films like Dee Dee's um, all the time. I, 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 a film like this really must be seen over and over and over again. Um, and, um, you know, that's the, that's the gift, I think, of, of Black Mariah. And that is how we have to overcome this moment that we're in, uh, I think. And I'm, I'm very proud of our filmmaking community that there's so many people jumping in and sharing, you know, film festivals are like, you know, pushing out the work and sharing the work. And, um, uh, you know, I just want to say, thank God for art. Hmm. Thank you. you know, thank God. Where would we be? Where would we be, Jean-Claude? I don't know where we would be, but I, I, I completely know. agree with you, Jane. Thank God for all, art. When all else fails, we have art and we must. And we know. are all artists and somehow or other, there's redemption in that somewhat. Yes. So um, I would say that, um, you know, when I, when I present in person or whenever um, I have the opportunity to uh, present a program, the real gift is when the filmmakers in the house and can talk about it and we can, you know, interact with that person. So I would say all of you folks that are in these, you know, our little boxes right now, there's Dee Dee, there's Jean-Claude, you know, raise your hand. <laughs> Michael, will you guide us in raising and how this part works if someone wants to speak? Sure. I've, I've opened up the chat. So one way is that you can type in a question or something else. Um, from my position as a host here, I can't see a hand raising feature. I, I see that Olivia Mattis has raised her hand and she is the director of the Sousa, Sousa Mendes Foundation. So Olivia, join us. Hi there. How are you? Go ahead. Film. What a beautiful film and it's interesting. Uh, I have my parents here who have joined the call and your story combines my mother's story with my father's story. My father's family having been saved by Susan Mendes and my mother having been a hidden child. So uh, in Belgium. Hmm. So uh, lots of parallels, lots of parallels. But my question is, was Madame Ducatel ever made righteous among the nations? Indeed not. When I, I wrote the Historical Society in Calais, once I found her name in the journal, and at first they said, oh, we can't possibly find out who she is. Do you know how many Ducatels there are in this region of France? Okay, we'll look. And the companion of the director of the society really dug into the municipal records. And she didn't leave any descendants, but we fa they found her house and tomb. Well, you see, I don't think that that's important for Yad Vashem. For Yad Vashem, the, the, the key 
uh, factor is the testimonial of the person who was rescued, which in your case, it's your mother's journal where her name is there, she's told you the story, you have this film, I think she's a prime candidate. I would be happy to help you if necessary. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Ellen Diamond has asked a question, if we've heard of the play, The Jungle. Yes, indeed, I saw it right after returning from Calais. And if you've seen the play, you can imagine how bizarre it was to be sitting on the benches with the dust in the theater, watching The Jungle having been the jungle had already been dismantled, but the conditions were very similar. So it was a very stark and dramatic experience to see the jungle after having been in Calais. Hi, Ellen. Other thoughts and questions? I see I have to look for your hands. Uh, hold on. Ellie, unmute yourself. Yeah. Is that right? It's hard, to, yeah. it's hard to think of Ellie as ever being mute. <laughs> I take that as praise. <laughs> um, do you think, well, first of all, I didn't realize Calais was such a port for immigration. Uh, then or, well, then, yes, because of the um, exodus from France because of the Nazi invasion, but how in the Syrian crisis has it been um, loaded with refugees? And how does Calais Care uh, uh, deal with that? Matilda. Is that, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I very well very good but there's always at least when when the jungle was in full function there were about 5,000 refugees in the jungle now there are about 5,000 refugees spread along the coastline in conditions worse than the jungle uh living hand to mouth and being viciously attacked by the police what the local residents and this is a very interesting point their attitude is on s'habitue we're used to it. We've seen it for years. They just don't see it anymore. And that's probably the indifference is probably worse than anything, wouldn't you say, Edith? Yes, I think also, Ellie, what you're asking is why Calais? It's the closest point yes. to England where asylum can hopefully be obtained. There are boats that leave every half hour, I'm sorry, yeah, and all the cargo trucks go across at that point, which is their main hope. That's how they hope to get across, inside trucks. Sadly, more recently, in small, in small inflatable boats, which don't always make it. Right, like any of the inflatable boats leaving the Caribbean or leaving Greece, they tip. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, the Channel is the most uh, heavily used shipping lane nearly in the world. So how they get across, I don't know. Two of the young men I worked with actually got across by canoe. I don't know how they did it, but it's that desperate. If, if I may say something about Ellie, uh, which is jumping from life to art. Uh, Eleanor Ren Renfield, who is Ellie, worked with me on creating a play about a bag lady in New York. That bag lady, it sort of just came out the bag lady was actually a refugee during World War II. The dreams wow. came up for her of what it felt like to hear boots on the ground. She was driven quite wild. I, there, there are reverberations, terrible reverberations for everyone, even those of us who are lucky enough to get through. Jean-Claude, we have five minutes and I'm mindful of everyone's time, especially on Mother's Day, Mother, Mothering Day. Um, would you begin to close us out by talking about how you started Shantigar, which you created this healing, creative place, and then we might sing a little. Hmm. I, Shantigar is an old farm in Western Massachusetts. Originally, my father was drawn to being here, probably because he felt it was safe. He never said that. But there's a way in which I've always sought, sought safety here. It's incredibly beautiful. 
artists of every, many artists, many meditation teachers. My teacher Trungpa Rinpoche gave it its name, Shantigar, which means peaceful home. Many of these people came here. There's something terribly nourishing about the land, about the beauty of the trees, the, the fields. It nourishes creativity. It is a peaceful home. Uh, I've been here, living here for over 50 years on and off. I, now that the plague has happened, the big challenge is for those of us who are at Chantigar, Didi is on the board, my friend Rand Engel who is here is on the board, Michael who you met is on the board, and Rosemary Quinn, Connie Childs. Uh, uh, we, we, and Deb Katz, we're trying to figure out how we can change bringing young urban artists up here to be literally on the land, to be inspired by nature, how we can do that online. So we're working on that. Uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing which has happened to all of us at this moment. moment. I don't know if all of us have taken it in or if I've taken it in, but I think our lives are changed forever. So we have to find a way to save our most intimate reality. I, I, and so Shantigar is working on that. I did want to uh, show this little tiny thing. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little, it's a little souvenir that my mother picked up when we were in Portugal. It, it seems to me so odd, but yet she picked up this little bell in Portugal. I think it's the, it's, it's the humanity, it's the individual person which is so moving. For every refugee that's coming now from South America, from Syria, from everywhere, and for us, the sounds, the sounds of, of, of our parents' voices, uh, it, it, it's, it is so terribly moving. Um, Michael, do you want to show that picture of my mother and me? I, I feel very personal about it, but if you can, I think of it as the lioness and her cub. She knew what was coming, clearly. Um, she's protective. And in some way, that, that has made my life possible. And it has also, it, it, it's something I've had to carry all, all the time. I think we're in a time now where we can all admit to each other our need for intimacy, our need for love. When I was growing up in Great Nick, the, my parents often played the music of Charles Trenet. It was also um, very important to Didi's mother. In a sense, I think, because Trenet is so cheerful. I was dancing around the movement room here to him this morning. He's in some sense the opposite of the terror of the Holocaust. You want to say something about that, Didi? Well, Michael, would you post this, the photograph? Here is my mother, Paulette, and Jean-Claude singing at a, my 50th birthday party some years ago. And when I showed it to Jean-Claude to remind him of it, he said it was either La Vie en Rose or Trenet's J'ai ta main dans ma main. I have your hand in my hand. And I said, oh, let, that's a song for our times. Let's take each other by the hand, even from afar. So we thought we would kind of close out this hour. I'm going to try to sing with you, but sometimes Zoom gets funky with two people singing. So we'll start. And if it gets funky, I'm going to let you finish it out. So we'll just finish at the end of that first part of the song. And dear friends, we are all connected. Stay safe. Reach out and good evening. J'ai ta main dans ma main. Je joue avec tes doigts. Il n'a pas de plus grand, de plus charmant bonheur que ta main dans ma main, que tes yeux dans mes yeux, que ta main qui joue avec. Mama, TV, sing.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. A bientôt. <laughs> dans mes yeux, que ta main dans ma main, que ta main qui joue avec ma main. <laughs>